Section 51 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. Society Gurgs from Sandy Mush. The following constitute the items of great interest occurring on the east side among the colored people of Blue Ruin. Montmorency Toosley of Pisan Ivy Avenue cut his foot badly last week while chopping wood for a party on Willow Street. He has been warned time and again not to chop wood when the sign was not right, but he would not listen to his friends. He not only cut off enough of his foot to weigh three or four pounds, but completely gutted the coffee sack in which his foot was done up at the time. It will be some time before he can radiate around among the boys on Pison Avenue again. Plum Beasley's house caught on fire last Tuesday night. He reckons it was caused by a defective flue for the fire caught in the north wing. This is one of Plum's bon mots, however. He tries to make light of it, but the wood he has been using all winter was white birch, and when he got a big dose of hickory at the same place last week, it was so dark that he didn't notice the difference, and before he knew it he had a bigger fire than he had allowed. In the midst of a pleasant flow of conversation, gas collected in the wood and caused an explosion which threw a parcel of live coals on the bed. The house was soon a solid mass of flame. Mr. Beasley is still short, two children. Mr. Granulation Hicks of Boston, Mass., who has won the deserved distinction in advancing the interests of Sir George Pullman of Chicago, is here visiting his parents, who reside on Upper Hominy. We are glad to see Mr. Hicks, and hope he may live long to visit Blue Ruin and propitiate up and down our streets. Miss Rosiola Cardamon has just been the recipient of a beautiful pair of chaste ear-bobs from her brother, who is a night watchman in a jewelry store run by a man named Tiffany in New York. Rosiola claims that Tiffany makes a right smart of her brother, and sets a heap by him whooping cough and horse distemper are again making fearful havoc among the better classes at the foot of pison ivy avenue we are pained to learn that the free reading room established over amalgamation brown's store has been closed up by the police blue ruin has clamoured for a free temperance reading room and brain retort for ten years and now a ruction between two of our best-known citizens over the relative merits of a natural pair and a doctored flush has called down the vengeance of the authorities and shut up what was a credit to the place and a quiet resort where young men could come night after night and kind of complicate themselves at there are two or three men in this place that will bully or bust everything they can get into, and they have perforated more outrages on Blue Ruin than we are entitled to put up with. There was successful doings at the creek last Sabbath, during which baptism was administered to four grown people and a dude from Sandy Mush. The pastor thinks it will take first rate, though it is still too soon to tell. Surrender Adams got a letter last Friday from his son, Gladstone, who filed on a homestead near Porcupine, Dakota, two years ago. He says they have had another of those unprecedented winters there for which Dakota is so justly celebrated. He thinks this one has been even more so than any of the others. He wishes he was back here at Blue Ruin, where a man can go outdoors for half an hour without getting ostracized by the elements. He says they brag a good deal on their ozone there, but he allows that it can be overdone. He states that when the ozone in Dakota is feeling pretty well and humping itself and curling up sheet iron roofs and blowing trains of the track, a man has to tie a clothesline to himself with the other end fastened to the doorknob before it is safe to visit his own hen house. He says that his nearest neighbor is 17 miles away 
and a man might as well buy his own chickens as to fool his money away on seventeen miles of clothesline it is a first-rate letter and the old man wonders who gladstone got to write it for him the valuable ecru dog of our distinguished townsman mr piedmont babbitt was seriously impaired last saturday morning by an eastbound freight he will not wrinkle up his nose at another freight train george wellington of hickory was in town the front end of the week he has accepted a position in the livery feed and sale stable at sandy mush call again george gabriel brent met with a sad mishap a few days since while crossing the french broad river by which he lost his leg anyone who may find an extra leg below where the accident occurred will confer a favor on mr brant by returning same to number six and a half pneumonia street it may be readily identified by anyone as it is made of an old pick handle and weighs four pounds j quincy burns has written a war article for century magazine regarding a battle where he was at in this article he aims to describe the sensations of a man who is ignorant of physical fear and yet yearns to have the matter submitted to arbitration he gives a thorough expose of his efforts in trying to find a suitable board of arbitration as soon as he saw that the enemy felt hostile and eager for the fray the forthcoming number of the century will be eagerly snapped up by mr burns friends who are familiar with his pleasing and graphic style of writing he describes with wonderful power the sense of utter exhaustion which came over him and the feeling of bitter disappointment when he realized that he was too far away to participate in the battle and too fatigued to make a further search for suitable arbitrators End of section 51「While Cigarettes to Ashes Turn » by James Whitcomb Riley Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person « While Cigarettes to Ashes Turn » 1. He smokes, and that's enough, says Ma, and cigarettes at that, says Pa. He must not call again, says she. He shall not call again, says he. They both glare at me as before, then quit the room and bang the door, while I, their wilful daughter, say, I guess I'll love them anyway. 2. At twilight in his room alone, his careless feet, inertly thrown, across a chair my fancy can, but worship this most worthless man. I dream what joy it is to set, his slow lips round a cigarette, with idle humoured whiff and puff, ah, this is innocent enough. To mark the slender fingers raise the waxen matches dainty blaze, whose chastened light an instant glows on drooping lids and arching nose. Then in the sudden gloom instead, a tiny ember, dim and red, blooms languidly to ripeness then, fades slowly and grows ripe again. 3. I lean back in my own boudoir, the door is fast, the sash ajar, and in the dark I smiling stare at one window over there with someone smoking pinks the gloom the darling darkness of his room i push my shutters wider yet and lo i light a cigarette and gleam for gleam and glow for glow each pulse of light a word we know we talk of love that still will burn while cigarettes to ashes turn end of poem this recording is in the public domain Says He by James Whitcomb Riley Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould Whatever the weather may be, says he, whatever the weather may be, It's plays if ye will, and I'll say me say, Supposin' today was the winterest day, Would the weather be changin' because ye cried, Or the snow be grass were ye crucified? The best is to make your own summer, says he, Whatever the weather may be, says he, whatever the weather may be. Whatever the weather may be, says he, whatever the weather may be. It's the songs ye sing and the smiles ye wear that's a-makin' the sunshine everywhere. And the world of gloom is a world of glee with the bird in the bush and the bud in the tree. Whatever the weather may be, says he, whatever the weather may be. Whatever the weather may be, says he, whatever the weather may be. 
ye can bring the spring with its green and gold and the grass in the grove where the snow lies cold and you'll warm your back with a smiling face as ye sit at your heart like an old fireplace whatever the weather may be says he whatever the weather may be end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 54 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. Where the Roads Are Engaged in Forking by Bill Nye. I'm writing this at an imitation hotel where the roads fork. I will call it the Fifth Avenue Hotel because the hotel at a railroad junction is generally called the Fifth Avenue or the Gem City House or the Palace Hotel. I stopped at an inn some years since called the Palace, and I can truly say that if it had ever been a palace, it was very much run down when I visited it. Just as the fond parent of a white-eyed two-legged freak of nature loves to name his mentally diluted son napoleon and for the same reason that a prominent horse owner in illinois last year socked my name on a tall buckskin colored colt that did not resemble me intellectually or physically a colt that did not know enough to go round a barbed wire fence but sought to shift himself through it into an untimely grave so this man has named his sway-backed wigwam the Fifth Avenue Hotel. It is different from the Fifth Avenue in many ways. In the first place, there is not so much travel and business in its neighborhood. As I said before, this is where two railroads fork. In fact, that is the leading industry here. The growth of the town is naturally slow, but it is a healthy growth. There is nothing in the nature of dangerous or wildcat speculation in the advancement of this place, and while there has been no noticeable or rapid advance in the principal business, there has been no falling off at all, and these roads are forking as much today as they did before the war while the same three men who were present for the first glad moments are still here to witness the operation. Sometimes a train is derailed, as the papers call it, and two or three people have to remain over as we did all night. It is at such a time that the Fifth Avenue Hotel is the scene of great excitement. A large codfish with a broad and sunny smile, and his bosom full of rock salt, is tied in the creek to freshen and fit himself for the responsible position of floor manager of the codfish ball. A pale chambermaid, wearing a black jersey with large pores in it through which she is gently percolating, now goes joyously up the stairs to make the little post office lockbox rooms look ten times worse than they ever did before she warbles a low refrain as she nimbly knocks loose the venerable dust of centuries and sets it afloat throughout the rooms whole is bustle about the house especially the chambermaid we were put in the guest's chamber here it has two atrophied beds made up of panes and counterpanes this last remark conveys to the reader the presence of a light joyous feeling which is wholly assumed on my part the door of our room is full of holes where locks have been wrenched off in order to let the coroner in Last night I could imagine that I was in the act of meeting personally the famous people who have tried to sleep here 
and who moaned through the night and who died while waiting for the dawn i have no doubt in the world but there is quite a good-sized delegation from this hotel of guests who hesitated about committing suicide because they feared to tread the red-hot sidewalks of perdition but who became desperate at last and resolved to take their chances and they have never had any cause to regret it we washed our hands on doorknob soap wiped them on a slippery elm court plaster that had made quite a reputation for itself under the nom de plume of towel tried to warm ourselves at a pocket inkstand stove that gave out heat like a dark lantern and had a deformed elbow at the back of it the chambermaid is very versatile and waits on the table while not engaged in agitating the overworked mattresses and puny pillows upstairs in this way she imparts the odor of fried pork to the pillowcases and kerosene to the pie she has a wild nervous and apprehensive look in her eye as though she feared that some herculean guest might seize her in his great strong arms and bear her away to a justice of the peace and marry her she certainly cannot fully realize how thoroughly secure she is from such a calamity she is just as safe as she was forty years ago when she promised her aged mother that she would never elope with any one still she is sociable at times and converses freely with me at table as she leans over my shoulder pensively brushing the crumbs into my lap with a general utility towel which accompanies her in her various rambles through the house and she asks what we would rather have tea or eggs this afternoon we will pay our bill in accordance with the lifelong custom of ours and go away to permeate the busy haunts of men it will be sad to tear ourselves away from the fifth avenue hotel at this place still there is no great loss without some small gain and at our next hotel we may not have to chop our own wood and bring it upstairs when we want to rest the landlord of a hotel who goes away to a political meeting and leaves his guests to chop their own wood and then charges them full price for the rent of a boisterous and tempest-tossed bed will never endear himself to those with whom he is thrown in contact we leave at two thirty this afternoon hoping that the two railroads may continue to fork here just the same as though we had remained end of section fifty four Section 55 McFeeter's Fourth by James Whitcomb Riley. Read for LibriVox.org by Brianna. It was needless to say it was a glorious day, and to boast of it all in that spread eagle way that our forefathers had since the hour of the birth of this most patriotic republic on earth. But it was justice, of course, to admit that the sight of the old star and stripes was a thing of delight, in the eyes of a fellow, however he tried, to look on the day with a dignified pride, that meant not to brook and turbulent glee, or riotous flourish of loud jubilee. So argued MacFeeters, all green and severe, who the long night before with a feeling of fear had slumbered but fitfully hearing the swish of the sky rocket over his roof with a wish that the urchin 
who fired it were fast to the end of the stick to forever and ever ascend or to hopelessly ask why the boy with the horn and its horrible havoc had ever been born or to wish in his wakefulness staring aghast that this fourth of july were as dead as the last so yesterday morning macfeeters arose with a fire in his eyes and a cold in his nose and a guttural voice in appropriate key with a temper as gruff as a temper could be he growled at the servant he met on the stair because he was whistling a national air and he growled at the maid on the balcony who stood and rapped with the tune of red white and blue that the band was discoursing like mad in the street with drumsticks that banged and with cymbals that beat and he growled at his wife as she buttoned his vest and applausively pinned the rosette on his breast of the national colors and lured from his purse some changes for the boys for firecrackers or worse and she pointed with pride to a soldier in blue in a frame on the wall and the colors there too and he felt as he looked on the features the glow the painter found there twenty long years ago a passionate thrill in his breast as he felt instinctively round for the sword in his belt what was it that hung like a mist over the room the tumult without and music the boom of the cannon the blare of the bagel and fife no matter macfeeters was kissing his wife and laughing and crying and waving his hat like a genuine soldier and crazy at that but it's needless to say it was a glorious day and to boast of it all in that spread eagle way that our forefathers have since the hour of birth of this most patriotic republic on earth and of poem this recording is in the public domain In a Box by James Whitcomb Riley. Read for LibriVox.org by Recording Person. In a Box. I saw them last night in a box at the play, old age and young youth side by side. You might know by the glasses that pointed that way that they were a groom and a bride. And you might have known too by the face of the groom and the tilt of his head and the grim little smile of his lip. He was proud to presume that we men were all envying him. Well, she was superb, and Elaine in the face, a Godiva in figure and mien, with the arm and the wrist of a Parian grace, and the high-lifted brow of a queen. But I thought in the splendour of wealth and of pride, and in all a young beauty might prize, I should hardly be glad if she sat by my side with that faraway look in her eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. Seeking to Set the Public Right. I would like to make an explanation at this time which concerns me, of course, more than anyone else, and yet it ought to be made in the interest of general justice also. I refer to a recent article published in a Western paper and handsomely illustrated in which, among others, I find the foregoing picture of my residence. The description which accompanies the cut, among other things, goes on to state as follows. The structure is elaborate, massive, and beautiful. It consists of three stories, basement and attic, and covers a large area on the ground. It contains an elevator, electric bells, steam heating arrangements, baths hot and cold in every room, electric lights, laundry, fire escapes, etc. The grounds consist of at least five acres overlooking the river for several miles up and down, 
with fine boating and a private fish pond of two acres in extent, containing every known variety of game fish. The grounds are finely laid out in handsome drives and walks, and when finished the establishment will be one of the most complete and beautiful in the Northwest. No one realizes more fully than I the great power of the press for good or evil. Rightly used, the newspaper can make or unmake men, and wrongly used, it can be even more sinister. I might say, knowing this as I do, I want to be placed right before the people. The above is not a correct illustration or description of my house for several reasons. In the first place, it is larger and more robust in appearance, and in the second place, it is not the same tout ensemble as my residence. My house is less obtrusive and less arrogant in its demeanor than the foregoing and has no elevator in it. My house is not the kind that seems to crave an elevator. An elevator in my house would lose money. There is no popular clamor for one, and if I were to put one in, I would have to abolish the dining room. It would also interfere with the parlor. I have learned recently that the correspondent who came here to write up this matter visited the town while I was in the South and as he could not find me he was at the mercy of strangers. A young man who lives here and who is just in the heyday of life gleefully consented to show the correspondent my new residence not yet completed. So they went over and examined the new Oliver Wendell Holmes Hospital which will be completed in June and which is, of course, a handsome structure, but quite different from my house in many particulars. For instance, my residence is of a different school of architecture, being rather on the Scandinavian order, while the foregoing has a tendency toward the ironic. The hospital belongs to a very recent school, as I may say, while my residence in its architectural methods and conception goes back to the time of the mound builders, a time when a gothic hole in the ground was considered the magnum bonum, and the scrumptious thing in art. If the reader will go around behind the above building and notice it carefully on the east side, he will not discover a dried coonskin nailed to the rear breadths of the woodshed. That alone ought to convince an observing man that the house is not mine. The coonskin regardant will always be found emblazoned on my arms, together with a blue goddess of liberty and my name in green India ink. Above I give a rough sketch of my house. Of course I have idealized it somewhat, but only in order to catch the eye of the keenly observant reader. The front part of the house runs back to the time of Polypus I, while the L, which does not show on the drawing, runs back as far as the cistern. In closing let me say that I am not finding fault with anyone because the above error has crept into the public prints, for it is really a pardonable error after all. Neither do I wish to be considered as striving to eliminate my name from the columns of the press, for no one could be more tickled than I am over a friendly notice of my arrival in town, or a timely reference to my courteous bearing and youthful appearance. But I want to see the Oliver Wendell Holmes Hospital succeed, and so I come out in this way over my own signature, and admit that the building does not belong to me, and that, so far as I am concerned, the man who files a lien on it will simply fritter away his time. End of section 57. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 58 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor, A Doset of Blues, by Bill Nye. I got no patience with blues at all, and I used to kind of talk against em and claim, till along last fall, they was none in the family stock. But a nephew of mine from Illinois that visited us last year, he kind of convinced me different while he was staying here. From ever which way that blues is from... They'd tackle him every ways. They'd come to him in the night, and come on Sundays and rainy days. They'd tackle him in corn plantin' time, and in harvest and early fall. But a dose of blues in the winter time, he loud was the worst of all. Said all diseases that he ever had, the mumps or the rheumatiz, er every other day, eggers bad, pert nigh as anything is or a carbuncle, say, on the back of his neck, or a felon on his thumb. 
but you keep the blues away from him and all of the rest could come and he'd moan there's nary a leaf below nor a spear of grass in sight and the whole wood piles clean under snow and the days as dark as night and you can't go out nor you can't stay in lay down stand up nor set and a case of regular typhoid blues would double him just clean shet i read his parents a postal card he could stay till springtime come and april first as i recollect was the day we shipped him home most of his relatives since then has either give up or quit or just died off but i understand he's the same old color yet end of section fifty eight Section 59 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dear Sir, Could you inform a constant reader of your valuable paper, where he would be most likely to obtain a good, durable, wild fox, which could be used for hunting purposes on my premises? i desire a fox that is a good roadster and yet not too bloodthirsty if i could secure one that would not bite it would tickle me most to death you know perhaps that i am of english origin some of the best and bluest blood of the oldest and most decrepit families in england flows through my veins there is no better blood extant we love the exhilarating sports of our ancestors and nothing thrills us through and through like the free chase cross country behind the fleeing fox joyously we gallop over the sward behind the yelping pack as we clearly scent high low jack and the game my ancestors are haughty english people from piscataquis county maine for centuries our rich warm red blood has been mellowed by the elderberry wine and huckleberry juice of moosehead lake but now and then it will assert itself and mantle in the broad and indestructible cheek of our race ever and anon in our family you will notice the slender triangular chest the broad and haughty sweep of abdomen and the high intellectual expanse of public bone which denotes the true englishman proud high-spirited soaked full of calm disdain wearing checked pantaloons and a soft flabby tourist's hat that has a bow at both ends so that a man cannot get too drunk to put it on his head wrong i know that here is democratic america where every man has to earn his living or marry rich people will scorn my high-born love of the fox chase and speak in a slighting manner of my wild wild yearn for the russian scamper of the hunt by jove but it is a joy indeed to gallop over the sward and the cover and the open land the meat and the cucumber vines of the plebeian farmer to run over the wife of the peasant and tramp her low cost children into the rich mould to sick the hounds upon the rude rustic as he paris greens his potatoes to pry open the jaws of the pack and return to the open-eyed peasant the quivering seat of his pantaloons returning it to him not because it is lacking in its merit but because it is not available oh how the pulses thrill as we bound over the lay out across the wold and on skimming the outskirts of the moor and going home with a stellated fracture of the duramata through which the gas is gently escaping let others rave over the dreamy waltz and the false joys of the skating rink but give me the maddening yelp of the pack in full cry as it chases the speckled two-year-old of the low-born rustic across the open and into the pond let others sing of the zephyrs that fan the white sails of their swift-flying yacht but give me the wild gallop at the tail of my high-priced hounds and six weeks at the hospital with a fractured rib and i am proud and happy all our family are that way we do not care for industry itself alone we are too proud ever to become slaves of industry we can labor or we can let it alone this shows our superiority as a race we've been that way for hundreds of years we could work in order to be sociable but we would not allow it to sap the foundations of our whole being i write therefore to learn if possible where i can get a good red or grey fox that will come home nights i had a fox last season for hunting purposes but he did not give satisfaction he was constantly getting into the pound i do not want an animal of that kind i want one that i shall always know where i can put my hand upon him when i want to hunt 
nothing can be more annoying than be compelled to go to the pound and redeem a fox when a party is mounted and waiting to hunt him i do not care so much for the gait of the fox whether he lopes trots or paces so that his feet are sound and his wind good i bought a light red fox two years ago that had given perfect satisfaction the previous year but when we got ready to hunt him he went lame in the off hind foot and crawled under a hen-house back of my estate where he remained till the hunt was over what i want is a young fleeless fox of the dark red or iron grey variety that i can depend upon as a good roadster one that will come and eat out of my hand and yearn to be loved i'd also like a tall red horse with a sawed-off tail one that can jump a barbed wire fence without mussing it up with fragments of his rider any one who may have such a horse or pipless fox will do well to communicate with me in person or by letter in closing references i may be found during the summer months on my estate spread out under a tree engaged in thought end of section fifty nine recording by kathy colas pine colorado section sixty of nye and riley's wit and humor this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor Sutter's Claim, Imitated By Bill Nye Say, you feller, you, with that spade and the pick, what do you pose to do on this side of the creek? Gonna tackle this claim? Well, I reckon you'll let up again pretty quick. No bluff, I understand, but the same has been tried, and the claim never panned, or the fellers has lied. Well, they tell of a dozen that tried it, and quit it most unsatisfied. The luck's dead again it. The first man I see that stuck a pick in it proved that thing to me, for he sort of took down and got homesick, and went back where he'd oughter be. Then others, they worked it, some more or less, but finally shirked it in grades of distress with an eye out, a jaw or a skull busted, or some sort of seriousness. The last one was plucky. He wasn't afeard, and bragged he was lucky, and said that he'd heard a heap of bluff talk, and swore awkward he'd work any claim that he cared. Don't you strike nary lick with that pick till I'm through. This here feller talks slick, and as pearl-like as you. And he says, I'll abide here as long as I please, but he didn't. He died here, and I'm his disease. End of section 60section 61 of Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Nye and Riley's Wit and Humor Seeking to be Identified by Bill Nye Chicago, February 20th, 1888 Financial circles here have been a good deal interested in the discovery of a cipher, which was recently adopted by a depositor and which began to attract the attention at first of a gentleman employed in the clearing-house. He was telling me about it and showing me the vouchers or duplicates of them. It was several months ago that he first noticed, on the back of a check passing through the clearing-house, the following cipher, written in a symmetrical Gothic hand. Dear Sir, herewith find payment for last month's butter it was hardly up to the average why do you blonde your butter your butter last month tried to assume an effeminate air which certainly was not consistent with its great vigour is it not possible that this butter is the brother to what we had the month previous and that it was exchanged for its sister by mistake? We have generally liked your butter very much, but we will have to deal elsewhere if you are going to encourage it in wearing a full beard. Yours truly, W. 
moneyed men all over chicago and financial cryptographers came to read the curious thing and to try and work out its bearing on trade everybody took a look at it and went away defeated even the men who were engaged in trying to figure out the identity of the snell murderer took a day off and tried their waterbury thinkers on this problem in the midst of it all another check passed through the clearing house with this cipher in the same hand sir your bill for the past month is too much you forget the eggs returned at the end of second week for which you were to give me credit the cook broke one of them by mistake and then threw up the portfolio of pie founder in our once joyous home i will not dock you for loss of cook but i cannot allow you for the eggs how you succeed in dodging quarantine with eggs like that is a mystery to yours truly w great excitement followed the discovery of this endorsement on a check for thirty two dollars and eighty seven cents everybody who knew anything about ciphering was called in to consider it a young man from a high school near here who made a specialty of mathematics and pimples and who could readily tell how long a shadow a nine-pound groundhog would cast at two o'clock and thirty-seven minutes p m on groundhog day if sunny at the town of fungus dakota provided latitude and longitude and an irregular mass of red chalk be given to him was secured to jerk a few logarithms in the interest of trade he came and tried it for a few days covered the interior of the exposition building with figures and then went away the pinkerton detectives laid aside their literary work on the great train book entitled the jerkwater bank robbery and other choice crimes by the author of how i traced a lame man through michigan and other felonies they grappled with a cipher and several of them leaned up against something and thought for a long time but they could make neither head nor tail to it ignatius donnelly took a powerful dose of kumis and under its maddening influence sought to solve the great problem which threatened to engulf the national surplus all was in vain cowed and defeated the able conservators of coin who require a man to be identified before he can draw on his overshoes at sight had to acknowledge if this thing continued it threatened the destruction of the entire national fabric about this time i was calling at the first national bank of chicago the greatest bank if i am not mistaken in america i saw the bonds securing its issue of national currency the other day in washington and i am quite sure the custodian told me it was the greatest of any bank in the union anyway it was sufficient so that i felt like doing my banking business there whenever it became handy to do so i asked for a certificate of deposit for two thousand dollars and had the money to pay for it but i had to be identified why i said to the receiving teller surely you don't require a man to be identified when he deposits money do you yes that's the idea well isn't that a new twist on the crippled industries of this country no that's our rule hurry up please and don't keep men waiting who have money and know how to do business well i don't want to obstruct business of course but suppose for instance i get myself identified by a man i know and the man you know and a man who can leave his business and come here for the delirious joy of identifying me 
and you admit that i am the man i claim to be corresponding as to description age sex etc with the man i advertise myself to be how would it be about your ability to identify yourself as the man you claim to be i go all over chicago visiting all the large pork packing houses in search of a man i know and who is intimate with literary people like me and finally we will say i find one who knows me and who knows you and whom you know and who can leave his leaf lard long enough to come here and identify me all right can you identify yourself in such a way that when i put in my two thousand dollars you will not loan it upon insufficient security as they did in cincinnati the other day as soon as i go out of town oh we don't care especially whether you trade here or not so that you hurry up and let other people have a chance where you make a mistake is in trying to rehearse a piece here instead of going out to lincoln park or somewhere in a quiet part of the city our rules are that a man who makes a deposit here must be identified all right do you know queen victoria no sir i do not well then there is no use in disturbing her do you know any of the other crowned heads no sir well then do you know president cleveland or any of the cabinet or the senate or members of the house no that's it you see i move in one set and you in another what respectable people do you know i'll have to ask you to stand aside i guess and give that string of people a chance you have no right to take up my time in this way the rules of the bank are inflexible we must know who you are even before we accept your deposit i then drew from my pocket a copy of the sunday world which contained a voluptuous picture of myself removing my hat and making a court salam by letting out four additional joints in my lithe and versatile limbs i asked if any further identification would be necessary hastily closing the door to the vault and jerking the combination he said uh, that would be satisfactory i was then permitted to deposit in the bank i do not know why i should always be regarded with suspicion wherever i go i do not present the appearance of a man who is steeped in crime and yet when i put my trivial little two-gallon valise on the seat of a depot waiting room a big man with a red moustache comes to me and hisses through his clinched teeth take your baggage off the seat it is so everywhere i apologize for disturbing a ticket agent long enough to sell me a ticket and he tries to jump through a little brass wicket and throttle me other men come in and say give me a ticket for bandolin oh and be damn sudden about it too and they get their ticket and go aboard the car and get the best seat while i am begging for the opportunity to buy a seat at full rates and then ride in the wood box i believe that common courtesy and decency in america need protection go into an hotel or a hotel whichever suits the hither and neither readers of these lines and the commercial man who travels for a big sausage casing house in new york has the bridal chamber while the meek and lowly minister of the gospel gets a wall pocket room with a cot a slippery elm towel a cake of cast iron soap a disconnected bell a view of the laundry a tin roof and four dollars a day but i digress i was speaking of the bank check cipher at the first national bank i was shown another of these remarkable endorsements 
it read as follows dear sir this will be your pay for chickens and other fowls received up to the first of the present month time is working wondrous changes in your chickens they are not such chickens as we used to get of you before the war they may be the same chickens but oh how changed by the lapse of time how much more indestructible how they have learned since then to defy the encroaching tooth of remorseless ages or any other man why do you not have them tender like your squashes i found a blue poker chip in your butter this week what shall i credit myself for it if you would try to work your butter more and your customers less it would be highly appreciated especially by yours truly w looking at the signature on the check itself i found it to be that of mrs james wexford of this city knowing mr wexford a wealthy and influential publisher here i asked him to-day if he knew anything about this matter he said that all he knew about it was that his wife had a separate bank account and had asked him several months ago what was the use of all the blank space on the back of a check and why it couldn't be used for correspondence with the remedy mr wexford said he'd bet five hundred dollars that his wife had been using her checks that way for he said he never knew of a woman who could possibly pay postage on a note remittance or anything else unless every particle of the surface had been written over in a wild delirious three-story hand later on i found that he was right about it his wife had been sassing the grocer and the butterman on the back of her checks thus ended the great bank mystery i will close this letter with a little incident the story of which may not be so startling but it is true it is a story of child faith johnny quinlan of evanston has the most wonderful confidence in the efficacy of prayer but he thinks that prayer does not succeed unless it is accompanied with considerable physical strength he believes that adult prayer is a good thing but doubts the efficacy of juvenile prayer he has wanted a jersey cow for a good while and tried prayer but it didn't seem to get to the central office last week he went to a neighbor who is a christian and believer in the efficacy of prayer also the owner of a jersey cow do you believe that prayer will bring me a yellow jersey cow said johnny why yes of course prayer will remove mountains it will do anything well then suppose you give me the cow you've got and pray for another one end of section sixty one the old cider mill by anonymous read for librivox dot org by Tavarish. if i could be a boy again for fifteen minutes or even ten i'd make a bee-line for that old mill hidden by tangled vines down by the rill where the apples were piled in heaps all round red streaked and yellow all over the ground and the old sleepy horse goes round and round and turns the wheels while the apples are ground straight for that old cider mill i'd start with light bare feet and lighter heart a smiling face a big straw hat homemade breeches and all that and when i got there i would just take a peep 
to see if old cider mill john was asleep and if he was i'd go snooking round till a great big round rice straw i'd found i'd straddle a barrel and quick begin to fill with cider right up to my chin as old as i am i can shut my eyes and see the yellow jackets bees and flies a swarming round the juicy cheese and bungholes drinking as much as they please i can see the clear sweet cider flow from the press above to the tub below and the steaming up into my old nose comes the smell that only a cider mill knows you may talk about your fine old crow your champagne sherry and so and so but of all the drinks of press or still give me the juice of that old cider mill a small boy's energy and suction power for just ten minutes or quarter of an hour and the happiest boy you ever saw you'd find at the end of that rice straw and i'll forego forevermore all liquors known on this earthly shore end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of nye and riley's wit and humor by james whitcomb riley and bill nye